This is Epicenter, episode 373 with guest Eric Wall. Hi, I'm Sebastian Cuccio, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we'll dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level and fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're on a Mac or iOS device, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks apple. And if you're new to the podcast, be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I hope everyone had lovely holidays, and I wanted to wish all of you a very happy new year 2021. I'm optimistic that things will begin to steer in a more positive direction this year, and I hope that we'll be able to do things like travel again and go to conferences. So in case you haven't noticed, crypto is going through a pretty significant bull run at the moment, and today's guest is fitting in this context. Now, keep in mind this interview was recorded in early December, which seems like an eternity from where we are now. Today, our guest is Eric Wall. He's the CIO of Arcane Assets. They're a European crypto hedge fund. But you probably know Eric best from his writings and his presence on Twitter, where he offers really valuable insights on crypto markets and crypto as an asset class. In this interview, Brian and Frederica discuss the current situation with Eric and how it should be compared to the 2017 bull run. There's some really interesting differences between these two market events. What's different this time? who will come out as the winners and who will get wrecked and where can things go from here, which I think is the most interesting thing to speculate about. They also discussed ways in which Bitcoin and Ethereum could evolve to, well, particularly accommodate increasing demand from institutional markets. Now, the institutional market demand side of things is something I had very little knowledge about before listening to this interview, but it was really interesting to understand how that's in many ways driving this bull run. I'm sure you're aware that bull markets are often accompanied by increased transaction fees. One inch optimizes transaction fees on all your trades and discovers the best prices across all DEXs and AMMs. I'll tell you more about one inch later on, but if you want to check them out now, go to epicenter.rocks slash one inch so they know you heard about them on Epicenter. And with that, here's our conversation with Eric Wall. So we're here today with Eric Wall. He is the chief investment officer of uh, Arcane Assets, and he's been involved in the Bitcoin space for a while, in the crypto space for a while. I've often enjoyed some of his analysis and insights, and he's marched, or he's been in this uh, fairly sparsely occupied space of like, you know, very Bitcoin bullish but also kind of open-minded to other things and not as maximalist as many. So I found his perspective interesting from that point of view and um, so glad to have you on. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So it's always interesting to hear kind of like how did people get started and like what triggered initially their, you know, their journey in this strange land of crypto. So what was it like for you? Uh, yeah, for me, it was uh, I was a, a computer science student at the uh, uh, Lund uh, University uh, here in Sweden, and uh, we were having computer science courses and studying, the, uh, for example, the uh, Tor network. And it was sort of during my exploration of the uh, the underworld of the darknet that I uh, came in touch with Bitcoin for the first time. I I have an, an article uh, bookmarked about Silk Road that's from. Uh, 2011, uh, but it took me uh, one year from reading about it for the first time and bookmarking the article. Uh, so it was in 2012 that I decided for the first time to uh, try making a small investment, uh, and that was on the Mt. Gox exchange. Uh, so obviously, uh, two years later, I would lose all of my bitcoins on Mt. Gox. So I was one of the. Uh, I am still one of the creditors of the uh, Mt. Gox exchange. Uh, so yeah, it it became like a, an interest for me. I wanted to understand. Uh, you know, I've always I've always been inter- interested in computer science, but I sort of if I hadn't gone into computer science, I think I would have gone into finance. And one thing that struck me as interesting about Bitcoin was that you had a new asset class, and it was like a clean slate where 
this instrument was trading, but there was very little, uh, it was largely uncorrelated to the rest of the market. And uh, it was like turning a new page on something where I felt like I had an opportunity to get in here. And the information that I would be able to accumulate on this asset class, uh, you know, I would have a chance to be, you know, one of the first and one of the foremost persons to accumulate knowledge on the subject and then trade it successfully. However, uh, quite embarrassingly for me, uh, initially and during my first years, I you know, started trading using technical analysis. And it took me until a couple of years into my computer science studies that I learned how to uh, program my trading strategies and backtest them. And after having done that for a while, I realized that there was very little empiric evidence for estimating that what I was doing uh, was successful and seeing that it could be potentially successful in the future. So there was no empirical basis for what I was doing. So there was no scientific science behind uh, using technical analysis. And that's when I started to think, you know, maybe there is a better way uh, to trade Bitcoin. What are the other factors that I can look uh, at and uh, see what types of information moves the market? So I started to read uh, Bitcoin mailing lists and because that was at least a couple of years ago technical developments in Bitcoin was something that inspired inspired people to become bullish on the asset that was something that was driving the price so sort of being able to forecast and understand where the te technological development is going at least then you were doing something scientific that you could uh, have a relation between uh, cause and effect and you could understand that okay if this thing happens then that's good for Bitcoin and then maybe I can enter a leveraged position here uh, before uh, most people know about this technical development. And then once it hit, uh, hits the press and people start to speculate based on that activity, let's say, for, for example, that somebody invents the Lightning Network and all of a sudden people start talking about, oh, Bitcoin is finally going to scale now as a medium of exchange and that causes people to speculate. So keeping track of those types of development, that's sort of how I started to go from being just this person that was trying to understand how do I speculate in this asset class as a regular Forex trader into someone who was studying the uh, protocol on an in-depth uh, level. Uh, so at the end of my computer science, it was a master's degree that I was doing. At the end of that, of my university period, it was time for me to write the master thesis. Uh, so I wrote the master thesis on Bitcoin, sidechains, uh, blockchain technology in general, and oracles. Uh, so when I came out uh, from the university in 2016, I had, I think I was one of the first or only people in Sweden that had an academic computer science based background on blockchains and Bitcoin. So that's sort of how I started my career. And then you joined a company named um, Sinope. What they did is they provided financial technology for exchanges and clearinghouses. Can you talk a little bit about um, what you did there? Yeah, so Sinobor was actually the company that put out the master thesis proposal for the master thesis that I later wrote. And what they were mainly concerned about and what they wanted to understand was if it was possible to leverage the technology that was powering Bitcoin to build a, a distributed securities depository. So in finance, you have exchanges. That's where the orders get uh, uh, matched. And then you have uh, the clearing layer. And then at the bottom, you have the settlement layer. And for securities, uh, securities are settled uh, in central securities depositories, CSDs. And it happens all over the world. And that was a component that Sinober hadn't previously built. Uh, and they were looking into building such a component that was going to be based on blockchain technology. So most people don't know a lot about Sinober. And I think that people will know even less about the firm moving forward now that it's been acquired by Nasdaq and it doesn't exist anymore. But before, before they got acquired by Nasdaq in 2019, uh, they were the uh, largest independent provider of market, and clear, uh, market technology, so exchange and clearing technology. Uh, they were a large competitor to, the largest competitor to Nasdaq for about 20 years. Uh, so I joined the firm as someone that would help them understand blockchain technology. And later on, I would take full responsibility for leading the blockchain and cryptocurrency strategy uh, at the firm. Um, and I, I can tell you one uh, sort of funny thing. Uh, on my first day that I joined Sinober, uh, the firm, we had a, a customer there and it was the Canadian, uh, the, the Canadian 
securities depository. So it's called the Canadian Depositories of Securities, CDS. And they were uh, becoming a client of Snowbird to receive exactly a settlement component, the CSD component that I was pe uh, talking about previously. And I, it was my first day on the job and I had just traveled up from Lund to Stockholm. And I had a, f a 40 degrees fever, uh, but I had taken multiple painkillers so that I, that I wouldn't miss my, my first day on the job. And on that first day, they told me that, okay, so we have the Canadian CSD here. And they've just said that they uh, are not going to purchase a CSD solution from Sinober unless it is blockchain based. And Eric, you are the only one that knows anything about CSDs running on blockchain technology. So why don't you go in and uh, yeah, tell them what, what we have in store for them. And you know, I, you know, I, I, I am a you know, computer scientist and I had at this point in 2016, I still had a very not in-depth understanding of finance yet that would uh, you know, come come later so during that meeting and you know, i was still and i was still confused about the financial terminology so i so so when they asked me if the csd component would be able to settle equities i had to um, i had to figure out equities is that security yeah, yeah, yes equities that's stocks right <laughs> so it was very difficult for me to jump in that quick uh, quickly but it was uh, it was uh, it was like learning the fire test, right? You get thrown in and you have to learn everything on the spot. So those uh, couple of years that I worked for Sonova came to be my a period of extreme learning where I had to figure out how the entire plumbing of financial infrastructure for uh, regulated, regulated markets uh, work. So yeah, that's sort of how I got started there. <laughs> wow, thrown in at the deep end. You, you already said that Sonova was uh, then acquired by NASDAQ. And uh, you worked for NASDAQ for another couple of months before you left, right? So what was it like to work at NASDAQ? Because from the outside, it seems like this gargantuan gray organization. And uh, tell us about this. I'll try to use nice words about this experience. But uh, basically what happened was that the uh, Sinober company, uh, they tried to spread out their businesses in too many fields at the same time and during that our treasury like the cash balance of our company uh, became dangerously low and the stock price subse subsequently uh, dropped and Nasdaq saw that as an opportunity to just outright acquire the firm. So I had at the time been uh, structuring and building out my position in the firm as the uh, so that I would have full control over the blockchain and cryptocurrency strategy and build out uh, my trust within the firm so that people understood that you know if i say that this is the best direction for our company in terms of what we should do with cryptocurrency then i wouldn't have to argue with people people would just you know after i'd proven myself in, within the firm they would just pretty much accept that uh, i knew that, that what i was talking about um so when nasdaq acquired the firm it happened at a quite a weird uh, time for me because i had just uh, sold a, a matching engine, the, the same matching engine that we uh, delivered to the London Metal Exchange and the Australian Securities Exchange. It's like a world-class, highly performant, I think it's the fastest matching engine in the world. And we had just assigned a contract to deliver that technology to Bitstamp, and they now run on that technology. But while the ink was uh, right about to touch the uh, paper with a deal with Bitstamp, that's when Nasdaq uh, made their bid on, on Snowbird. So then, you know, the, my whole process of building a cryptocurrency offering uh, from within Snowbird sort of got uh, shaken a bit by this whole Nasdaq acquisition. And later on, not long after the acquisition from Nasdaq was complete, uh, they shut down the entire cryptocurrency offering that I had built and, you know, just replaced it with their own. So um, my work, the things that I had been working at Sinover pretty much got shut down uh, by the Nasdaq acquisition. And after when the merger uh, was starting to happen, I got thrown into the uh, Nasdaq uh, blockchain team. And the still Nasdaq today, they're not a cryptocurrency first company. They do deliver matching engines to some cryptocurrency exchanges. But I was all about, you know, I was in Sinobra, I was all about, you know, actually meeting the cryptocurrency industry head on. I was, uh, we were one of the 500 first companies to run a, a lightning node. And we were really trying to engage with this technology, whereas Nasdaq sort of want to have a backseat uh, in, 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 in that whole development. 
so the th team that I got thrown into was uh, still a team that was working on trying to blockchain everything. So they had a, a, a blockchain uh, network between some mutual funds and some banks, and they were trying to onboard customers onto this private blockchain. And I got to sit down with the uh, team and look at how they've architectured the uh, blockchain that they were using. And I could notice like several points within this uh, blockchain architecture where things were happening in a completely centralized manner. And so I raised you know, the, the concern that you, know, you, you have a blockchain, you know, it has the blockchain name on it, but you're not actually getting any of the benefits that the, of a blockchain when you're, when, you're, when you're matching orders in a centralized manner, and then only later, uh, they were just using a blockchain as, as a place where you could record events that had already happened, but there was no decentralized aspect to that at all. So I think that's probably the main reason why I didn't uh, stay why the um, my relationship with Nasdaq wasn't long lived uh, was primarily primarily because that uh, yeah there was some agreement disagreements between me and the team on how you do blockchain uh, correctly I would say yeah and and also another thing one of the, one of the first things that they told me when I joined the firm was that you don't have to worry you know on Nasdaq you'll never have more than uh, six bosses above you. And you know, I was used to having just one boss, and I thought that was sometimes too much. You know, so having six bosses, and you have to try to navigate a cryptocurrency strategy with six bosses above you, where from each each step, uh, from each boss, uh, the knowledge about cryptocurrency and blockchain decreases, and at the end, it's uh, basically no knowledge at all. So that's not the uh, yeah. For me, I think I was better uh, suited to work in a startup. OneInch is a decentralized exchange aggregator that sources liquidity from the top DEXs and AMMs to save you money and time on swaps. OneInch finds the best possible trading paths across over 20 supported liquidity protocols and splits them up across multiple market depths. I started using OneInch last summer and since then it's become my go-to aggregator. I use it every time I need to make a swap. They recently launched V2, which has a brand new API. It greatly improves their routing algorithm and my favorite part about the V2 is the new UI. It's super clean and easy to use. These improvements ensure that you get the best rates on your swaps with the lowest possible response time. So the next time you need to make a swap, forget about getting the best rate or optimizing your gas fees. Make it easy on yourself. Just use one inch. And you can let them know that we sent you by going to epicenter.rocks slash one inch. That's one I-N-C-H. We'd like to thank one inch for their support of the podcast. Actually, around the similar time, I was work, working for this enterprise blockchain startup too, and you know we were kind of a technology provider to you know to some banks and you know insurance companies, and the, so I'm I'm kind of you know, I'm a bit familiar with that space, although I haven't touched it as well since late 2016. I'm curious, like, how has that all played out? You know, this entire effort that happened you know it started with you know r3 was at one point like a big and there was this digital asset company right was doing a lot of things and you know a bunch of others and you know they're basically relying on the premise right that you could use blockchains as this underlying substrate in the traditional finance ecosystem right so you wouldn't have to deal with cryptocurrency so much but you could use it in there and you know get all of these benefits and improvements like, have you followed this at all? And like, how, how do you think that has developed? Um, yeah, so I was, uh, for, in 2017, I think I was as immersed and involved as you can, could be uh, uh, in that whole space. We had conversations with R3 and we were uh, running blockchain experiments on Hyperledger Fabric. Like we were way deep into all of that. And I, the, the problem that I identified was that uh, if you wanted to build a financial substrate using blockchain technology for a large network of participants, that was very difficult to do because when you had that many people around the same table, making progress was extremely slow paced and difficult. And at the same time, there were some startups that were acting in a much leaner fashion that basically developed the whole solution uh, with one or two parties, and then after that, try to get buy-in from existing networks. And that also 
proved very difficult to do because the existing incumbents didn't want to get onboarded into a system where they had no, they have hadn't been participants in 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 producing that solution. So it's uh, fundamentally, I, I I found that the, the two paths that you can approach the problem, both of them have bootstrapping problems. Um, so in 2018 or around that time, I said that uh, you know while I think that. Eventually, I, I believe that the entirety of finance, at least if you focus on the settlement aspect of it, will run on a blockchain-based network. I didn't find it that it was uh, productive to be engaged in this industry at this point in time because, you know, it could happen that the uh, permission sector uh, finds a solution and starts using that. But it could also happen that, it's, it, that they instead connect to the open blockchains. And start using those, and that's a much more interesting and uh, you know a genuinely a place where innovation truly happens and where there's a lot more passion. It's a decision between: do you want to try to make the internet happen through the means of an intranet, or do you want to go to the public, open, borderless internet and try to bring on the masses from there? And so I, I chose I chose to go the public. Uh, route, I have more faith in the possibility of that being a success for finance. Uh, so I, in 2018, I basically left and I cut all my, you know, I stopped reading all the information that was coming out from the private blockchain space. Now, I've heard uh, from some of my colleagues that are still in that industry that the private blockchain space for finance is still moving forward um, and that, you know, they are pretty excited about where things are going but i haven't seen like any firm examples of any real world deployment where people are using these private blockchains in a way that should be not noteworthy for us or something that we should you know, pay attention to so you are now the cio cio at um, a fund named arcane assets so that's obviously a hard gear change ca coming from the from the um, permission blockchain space. So I know that uh, for regulatory reasons, you can't tell us everything about this fund, but uh, can you tell us a little bit? Uh, yeah, sure. And I, I mean, I, I suppose it sounds like a, a, a gear change, but uh, from my perspective, it was uh, something that I had been doing from the moment that I got started in the cryptocurrency industry. It was like I was doing it on a, on a, on a, personal level where I was managing my own cryptocurrency portfolio uh, and I was doing that uh, starting with Bitcoin from 2012 and kept doing that, doing that in 2014, 2015 and 2017 when sort of the mainstream got attracted to the cryptocurrency industry and they start to talk about okay we want exposure to cryptocurrencies uh, but I've heard that uh, Bitcoin is not uh, scalable or that it's consuming as much electricity as the uh, a small country, shouldn't I have some of these other cryptocurrency assets? And then I found myself in the position of advising them and trying to correct the misconceptions that they had. And if they wanted some altcoin exposure, you know, I can facilitate that, but I want to make sure that we subtract 99.99% .99 of everything that's just pure bullshit uh, out there. And even, I think in sometimes in many cases, it would even be better decision to have short positions on, on some of those altcoins because that can be a profitable uh, strategy if you want to maximize your uh, Bitcoin holdings. So I, I, I had all these requests and I started actually in 2017 as a sort of side project while I was still working at, at Zenober to launch a fund together with two other financial professionals in, in Sweden. So when the Nasdaq acquisition happened I, um, and I quit Nasdaq, then I uh, sat down and I wrote a list of all the different opportunities that I could uh, join and participate in in the cryptocurrency market and running a managing a fund was on that list and then you know I just eliminated all the different options on that list until I was only left with one or two and then I chose to to go down this route because it is genuinely like if I if I could imagine you know one dream job one thing that I can imagine myself you know waking up and you know completely being in love with what I do, then managing a cryptocurrency fund is the thing that gets me closest to the things that I'm passionate about. And, and for those who know me and follow me on Twitter, you know that one of the main things that I am passionate about is 
debunking altcoins, reading white papers, finding flaws. Uh, so by running a fund, I can put that interest of mine to full-time use so that I can just detect what are the things that we should avoid in the, uh, the, the uh, cryptocurrency uh, fund should be uh, avoiding. And there was a Norwegian company uh, that had recently launched. It's called Arcane. It's about to become a publicly listed company. It's uh, it will be the uh, second the, uh, the the second company in the Nordics that is a publicly listed cryptocurrency company. And they were uh, very happy to uh, embrace my ambitions at the firm and facilitate. Uh, so that basically all I have to do is decide on you know portfolio construction and all the other aspects when it comes to building out the partnerships with the, uh, custodians, exchanges, and uh, complying with regulation. All that would be taken care uh, of by Arcane, and I will only manage the fund. So that's sort of the ideal uh, relationship between me and the Arcane company. And we started the fund in uh, in April. And uh, I have been managing it since. Uh, so far, I'm very, very happy with with uh, that job and what it's been like, especially in this type of environment, which we have been in, which has been extremely uh, exciting and interesting. But yes, uh, sadly, I cannot talk about uh, what the strategy of the fund is and other metrics about the fund, because we do have to uh, abide by MIFID II regulations and they are extremely, extremely harsh when it comes to talking and marketing uh, cryptocurrency funds to retail investors. So, yeah, I cannot say that much more about that, unfortunately. Okay, well, then let's let's dive a bit into sort of talking about uh, your own investment thesis and how you think about, you know, different assets and, you know, their value proposition. And let's start with Bitcoin, which is the thing that, you know, you focused on the most. What's the case for Bitcoin? What's the th your thesis behind Bitcoin? At this point in time, uh, during all these eight years that I have been looking on at Bitcoin, I don't think that there has ever been uh, a moment where I've been as bullish on Bitcoin as I am today. And the reason for that uh, is quite simple, really. And I think this has been repeated in multiple outlets as of late, but it's it's just that Bitcoin is becoming accepted as an asset class in the mainstream uh, view. So you have uh, some of the largest hedge funds in the world and largest asset managers, uh, asset managers in the world that are now looking at Bitcoin, not as this weird, uh, funky technology that is used by uh, people who want to purchase drugs on the dark net. Like genuinely, they're, what, when I speak with these uh, hedge funds today, like what the conversation is about is, how much liquidity is this? Is it in this asset class? If we want to allocate two hundred million dollars, will there be enough liquidity for us to enter? And more importantly, will there be enough liquidity for us to exit the asset class? So it's being treated now uh, completely as you know how they would look at any other asset. It's just an investment opportunity for them now, not this strange thing. And I think that. The only thing that Bitcoin needs to succeed is that people start to think about Bitcoin in a serious manner. Because when you start to treat Bitcoin as a real asset class, as a as an investable good, uh, and then you start then you start looking at the the fundamental uh, properties of Bitcoin, and you look at uh, the how scarce is this asset? What's what is the supply? Uh, like, for example, if you start comparing it to gold, you will immediately recognize a number of different advantages that Bitcoin has. And not only in terms of how uh, easy versus hard it is to transfer the asset uh, or how you can program the asset, um, but also in terms of like what is the market cap of Bitcoin uh, relative to gold. And it's, it's orders of magnitudes difference, right? So in terms of the return profile, like how many multipliers of returns that you can expect if Bitcoin continues on this trajectory, then it's looking like the investment opportunity of, of, of a decade or a century or, or, or a millennia even. So uh, the investment case for Bitcoin, I think it's just that this is, if we look at the most recent announcements from uh, I think the CIO of BlackRock, which, which is the largest asset manager in the world, uh, came out and said that you know cryptocurrencies are here to stay bitcoin could replace gold and that's just on the back of number of other high profile investors such as uh, 
Stan Lee Druckenmiller, Bill Miller, um, Paul Tudor Jones, uh, you know, each of these investors coming out and just talking about Bitcoin in a completely like this, the rhetoric and the, the phrasing on how they talk about Bitcoin now, it would have been like if we sent if we screenshotted those articles and we sent them back to Reddit in 2016 and we saw what people wrote, that would be like, you know, people would say like, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, in my in my most optimistic dreams, this is what I thought was going to happen. But seeing it actually happen is like it's 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 so bizarre and it's really like it's it's it really blows my mind to understand that we are in a, a point in time now where this is actually happening. And I think that you know now we've had enough macro investors uh, that have endorsed Bitcoin in such a way that you know the acceptance is there and it's only a matter of time before this acceptance uh, spreads to other investors. So I really do think that Bitcoin is going to become like this store of value use case that we have talked about in the cryptocurrency industry. This store of value use case for Bitcoin, I think it's going to happen. I, I, I don't think that there's any way that we can put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, it's generally going to happen. And if, if the store of value use case for Bitcoin happens, then the medium of exchange aspect that comes later in, in, in this evolution, it, it, it follows naturally. Like if, if, you are, if, if you are completely comfortable with storing your wealth in Bitcoin, then you wouldn't feel strange by accepting Bitcoin as a form of payment for something, right? Like if, you, if, if somebody wanted to settle a debt in Bitcoin and you use Bitcoin as a store value asset, then that wouldn't be a strange thing for you to do. So I can start. I can sort of see now how all of these things will just unfold one after one, and that we are on a trajectory in such a cemented way that it's starting to look like it's starting to look like in, instead of it being a long shot, it's starting, starting to look like it's unlikely that this wouldn't happen. You know. So I I, I, w I went on a Stefan Liveros podcast recently to talk exactly about this because I, I, I there are of course you know some. Issues as well, especially when we talk about me, uh, Bitcoin as a, a medium of exchange. You know, people will, will immediately start to talk about, you know, uh, okay, so how are those? How is the Bitcoin blockchain going to process all those transactions, and what are the transaction fees going to be? And if the transaction fees are going to be very high, is that going to lock out, uh, you know, the poor people out from the system? So there's a lot of. Once we get into the medium of exchange era of Bitcoin, I think there's going to be a lot of other problems that uh, we'll have to address and that we'll have to solve. But I think that where we are now, where the store of value use case is getting cemented is at least, you know, a very, very big and important step on the way there. I think that was a great explanation and I, I very much agree with your assessment. I mean, the, the thing that strikes me here is, so I, I became interested in Bitcoin in like middle 2013, which was just like when this bull market of 2013 was, was starting. And the interesting thing is, it was the same stories that were like we sort of told back then because it was kind of obvious to everyone. Okay, well, if if this is really be, you know the the price potential was obvious, right? If everybody starts using this as store of value, then the price will go so high, and then obviously, you know, institutional investors and stuff they will start holding this, and then if one recognizes even a chance of that happening. And the signs like some probability, then it kind of makes sense to like front run this, just and then it becomes a self fulfilling prophecy, right? So that was already there as this expectation back then, and I remember people were like, "Yeah, no, this is going to come, right?" And the Bitcoin ETF was already, you know, this kind of image people were aspiring to, and it's interesting that you had, you know, back then, of course, it didn't happen, and then you had the 2017 bull market and again, it kind of didn't happen, and now it's happening. So why is it happening now? It really felt like it's the way that you describe it, like Bitcoin was in a way like a rigged game from the it, it, were, it was rigged in such a way that we could sort of see all of these steps uh, fall together ahead of time. But it was still like just seeing it actually play out in, in reality is a wholly different experience from fantasizing about it. Uh, but yeah, why it's happening now? I mean, I think that uh, the the most obvious answer that to that question is of course, that we, we are currently right now in a period of the greatest monetary expansion of all time. I mean, if you look at the uh, uh, money supply charts, 
since the corona uh, virus pandemic uh, spread and the uh, government, uh, the fiscal and the monetary responses to that uh, have inflated the money supply. I mean, it, I, those are that's I mean, that's got to be the trigger. I mean, if you look at what uh, Paul Tudor Jones and Rockenmiller and these other high profile investors that we were talking about previously, what are the what are the rationale that they are giving? And they are almost always referring to the uh, macroeconomic environment and uh, about the macroeconomic environment. I know that a lot of people are talking about, you know, that we are headed for hyperinflation and I don't think that inflation, you can measure it in a number of different different ways. It's uh, kind of a sticky issue. But I think that the, the, mo the, the, fundam the fundamental driver that is catapulting Bitcoin into the spotlight right now is not necessarily the macroeconomic factors themselves, but it's more about the narratives that the macroeconomic uh, factors give consequence to. So when you see central banks... Uh, expand their balance sheets and you see the the broad money supply that is out there that's actually out and circulating in the con economy when you see such heavy expansion happening there and you and you, you, you it, it leads you to start to think about scarce assets in a in a light in, in a more positive light so it's not necessarily that something needs to happen like i don't think that the global financial system needs to collapse in order for people to start thinking about the negative sides and the impact uh, that the central banks have on the economy for people to start looking at bitcoin and i think it's pretty interesting if you look at if you if we go back to in march i remember distinctly i remember two uh, different forecasts one was given by mike novogratz and the other was given by arthur hayes who's the uh, ceo of bitmex uh, both of them in march uh, immediately as uh, the stock market plummeted and the uh, money supply was being uh, expanded, that's what both of them predicted at that point in time that we would see Bitcoin at uh, $20,000 uh, $20, uh, by the end of the year. So I don't think that anything necessarily needed to happen uh, other than that Bitcoin would be brought back into the limelight. And what's been beneficial for like what's been so beneficial, like I think Bitcoin has been quite lucky in a way that we had this uh, huge bull run in 2017. And like you said, you know, not, nothing really happened into in 2017, except that uh, a lot of retail investors were speculating on Bitcoin being adopted by the institutions. And then after the CME futures launched in, in December of 2017, there were retail didn't you know you couldn't you could no longer front run the institutions anymore because the 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 CME the Chicago Mercantile futures they were out there and they were available to institutions well at least the retail re retail investors thought that they were but uh, in reality there's a more complex process for that how that really works but so 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 the only thing that happened when when those futures launched was that the retail demand disappeared from the market because there was no, you couldn't front run Wall Street anymore, and then demand disappeared, and then prices collapsed, and we went into a three-year bear market. But what was really lucky about that was that uh, at least, at least in 2017, Bitcoin got sufficiently large, and there were sufficiently large uh, transaction uh, exchange volumes that it got a number of industry participants, like in, uh, large in, uh, industrial. Actors such as, uh, for, for example, Fidelity to start to build out uh, custody solutions for Bitcoin. And you had other futures market launching, you had options exchanges launching and uh, professional custodians launching and ways that you could aggregate, deal, uh, aggregate uh, execution flow from different trading avenues. So all these different tools that sort of institutional investors want when they allocate to Bitcoin, because Bitcoin peaked in 2017 and it was put on the map. Uh, for many of these players, the infrastructure slowly got built out, uh, built out and got hardened over time. So now that the macroeconomic environment, the catalyst for the macroeconomic, uh, macroeconomic environment happened in 2020, all that infrastructure that we needed for Bitcoin in order to, able, to be able to truly blossom uh, had been built out. So the timing was perfect. I mean, I, I describe it as like 2017 was like a knock on the door. Uh, so that everybody had time to get all those things together and get their papers done so that when the real train departure was coming three years later, everyone had every, all their stuff in order. 
So that's where we are right now. All the bags have been packed, all the passports have been stamped, and we are ready to go. So it's, uh, I think it was very lucky that you know, we had th exactly three years' time to prepare everything, and that's, I think that's you know, exactly what we needed. So the timing is just you know, uh, like a godsend, I think. So you think the primary value proposition of Bitcoin right now um, is store value. So if you look at how miners are compensated for keeping the network secure, the mining reward is actually going down and down and down. So in the end, basically, the only fees that will go to miners who, in effect, keep the net network secure will be from transaction fees, right? Um, so how does how is this commensurate with um, this um, store of value hypothesis? That's always like the, the one question that uh, sort of puts a nail like it's I think that it's probably the best argument or one of the, the 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 most difficult arguments to tackle as a Bitcoiner like what are we going to do like are the uh, incentives to uh, secure the network going to be strong enough when we rely on these volatile transaction fees and as we've seen you know transaction fees can sometimes be very high when there's a lot of load on the network and then they can be like drastically they can be like one percent or even less of that when you know, it, it's not like a linear function, like you, you increase the load by uh, 50%, then transaction fees don't necessarily increase 50%, they can increase 5,000%, right? So it's this sort of unstable dynamic and building a security for the system based on that very unstable incentive, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that is a, a, a problem, right? So the way that I see it, it's going to take a number of years, uh, decades even, before the block reward becomes so small that it's going to be a problem. And it's, I think it's very difficult to start to sort of, um, it's, it's very difficult to have a conversation right now about how are we going to tackle the problems that we're going to face several decades from now. I think that you know, we are still in a phase where this problem is getting uh, better understood and more uh, studied and the technological solutions that you could possibly design to address that problem, they are also still not, I mean, I, I don't think that we have a clear answer on what the best uh, answer is yet, but I think that, uh, you know, somebody explained it that the Bitcoin is a bet on human ingenuity. Uh, so it, it is in one way a bet that we have the brain power within the cryptocurrency community to eventually address even problems like this. And I think that, you know, 10 years from, I mean, who knows what type of uh, solutions that we could come up with to address this problem. I think that, uh, for instance, if you look at the Ethereum, they, they've just, uh, they're, well, uh, they have uh, one uh, method of addressing the, uh, this problem, which uh, it's called the uh, Ethereum Improvement Proposal 1559. Uh, it's a way that harmonizes transaction fees over time. Uh, so I think that you know, we, c we have still have so much to learn and experimentation that can be done uh, in terms of how consensus networks uh, both handle fees and how they secure themselves over time. So I think that it's perhaps premature to say that, oh, we're never going to find a solution to this problem. I think that we will almost definitely find a solution to this problem. And even, and I'll say something that sounds perhaps not very uh, kosher to what other Bitcoiners find to be kosher. But I mean, let's say, okay, let's say that uh, Bitcoin, you, we weren't able to secure Bitcoin on transaction fees alo uh, alone. And we need, let's say, a 1% inflation rate in Bitcoin. Let's say that that's what we need. And let's say that all the Bitcoiners, they refuse to, to this would be a hard fork in the protocol. It would be a new currency. Let's say that all the Bitcoiners, they refuse to get onboarded onto this fork because it would extend the Bitcoin supply beyond 21 million. And that's the cap that everyone you know, uh, loves so much. Uh, but you know, somebody can still take the Bitcoin UTXO set and they can secure the Bitcoin UTXO set under any type of mechanism, any type of, of uh, consensus mechanism that you want. So for instance, you could secure Bitcoin using uh, very small inflation. That could be one way to do it. Uh, you could secure Bitcoin by using, let's say, a highly distributed federated chain that just uh, sign, uh, signs transactions on a, on a trusted basis where you just trust them to, to act in the, best, in, in the best manner for the network. 
uh, you could uh, potentially do something like Ethereum is doing, where you're securing Bitcoin under proof of stake and you, you, you allow a per sufficient portion of transaction fees to be burnt over time so that the inflation rate in the system still nets out to plus minus zero. And that's how you would still have the cap limited to 21 million. And, I, and, I, and you know, we are so st still so early in trying to figure out this, the, the uh, solutions to these problems. I've listed three different options, and I'm just some guy. And I let's see who can come up with better solutions 10 years or 20 years from now, right? That was super interesting, and uh, I love your answer here. I agree with you. There are going to be many solutions. And, you know, you mentioned a bunch, and I think they're all, you know, they all sound pretty plausible. But the big issue is, you know, if you think back to the block size debate. And of course, for people who've been in Bitcoin, probably newer people don't remember this much. But for years, that was the thing that dominated like what, you know, the Bitcoin discussions and there was such, such controversies around it. And it was really about a very simple parameter change to say basically, oh, do we want to stick with a one megabyte block size or go to something higher? And, you know, what we saw was just an inability to come to some agreement about how to change things. And of course, there is a big benefit to that because if it doesn't change things, you know, you can rely on this, right? You, you don't have to worry about Bitcoin kind of changing in these unexpected ways. And, you know, that's a benefit in some ways over something like Ethereum. But then at the same time, I think if, if all of the solutions you propose they are much more radical changes, right, than a block size change. And I think as Bitcoin actually gets more adopted and more dispersed and, you know, more people hold it in different ways that maybe have also less connection to how does the system actually work, I think it will just become harder to make those changes. So, But uh, to go back to that uh, block size, debate, I mean, we have to also keep in mind that something did happen, right? We did increase the block size SegWit was a block size increase, so it's we had this block size debate, edit, but it actually ended with Bitcoin increasing uh, the block size. So something did happen. So we uh, we, we didn't increase the block size by eight megabytes or more than that, and we didn't come to agreement on how to increase the block size for the future. But at least we we did something, right? And I think that. Um, all it's going to take, like, uh, in, in the block size debate, it was still, like, uh, people understood. I mean, the, the block size debate started in, and he started to heat up in 2015, in 2016, but the transaction fees were still pretty low then. It was only in 2017 where the transaction fees reached, uh, like, $20 at, were at, at its peak. And that was, uh, so that was not the climate that the uh, block size debate had been discussed in. By that point in time, we had already deployed uh, segregated witness, right? So I think that if we are in a, an environment where the, uh, there's a lot more urgency, I mean, it's just going to take that someone, when we are reaching a point where the subsidies or the, the block rewards are getting scaringly low, people are going to analyze the hell out of this and some university or trusted uh, academic institution is going to come out with very convincing evidence that in three years time we're going to have an unstable dynamic and, you know some people will say that's fud and then you know one and a half year down the line it's gonna we're gonna start to see the effects of, of that happening and it's just gonna take you know i i still believe that the most of the bitcoin core developers like if they are prevented with hard evidence that this is not going to work, then they will say, yeah, that's not going to work. So we have we have a few different options of what, what to do now. Either we stay on this chain that has no inflation and we, we just hope that the transaction fees are going to uh, resolve themselves, like they're going to gonna, gonna, uh, secure the network and be stable enough in order for that to be viable. If, if it gets sufficiently bad, there's going to be sufficient urgency for a large portion of people to want to try other alternatives. And if they don't want to try that, if there are people who stay on a chain that doesn't work, then that chain is going to go to zero and a fork of the system is going to continue living on. And the nice thing about it is that all those people that had UTXOs, like all the people that had Bitcoin on the fork that died and didn't survive, 
all those people are going to have bitcoins on the system that does survive. So you don't actually have to make a decision. You just you can hold your bitcoin. Doesn't matter which fork of bitcoin. Even and I'm not saying that we necessarily. You know, I have to play nice with the bitcoiners that are listening to this podcast. I'm not saying that the uh, uh, bitcoin needs to hard fork to survive, but let's say it has to survive, then you're still going to have bitcoin on whichever fork of it survives, even if it has. Uh, inflation or if it's federated or using an Ethereum type of solution where you burn transaction fees to keep the uh, uh, supply intact. So yeah, I think you know urgency is going to be the, the key here and whatever happens, those who own Bitcoin are going to own Bitcoin on their surviving solution. I think that's a completely fair point to make. Um, so the other big tribe in this ecosystem are the Ethereans. So you are somewhat of a rare breed in that you are not a big Bitcoin maximalist or an Ethereum maximalist. You live somewhere in between. So what do you use the value proposition of ETH when Bitcoin is store value? Yeah, I think um, the value proposition of Ether uh, has gotten pretty clear this year. For, for me, it's always been very difficult to talk about. Ethereum, because uh, most of my uh, community friends, they are Bitcoiners and they see, they cannot, they're, they're never, they're, they are never going to uh, shake the idea that Ethereum is this scam. It's Vitalik's pre-mined scam and he was doing uh, fake quantum computers before and uh, Ethereum is full, uh, filled with bugs and uh, uh, everybody's just going to lose their money. And, you know... So it's it's I, I do see you know a, a, a value in Ethereum uh, as a platform, uh, but it's hard for me to talk about that. So I didn't do it. Uh, it took a long time before I was until I said fuck it. You know I'm just going to say what I think in this regard. Uh, so while I wasn't you know public about it on Twitter, if, when I spoke to my people that I was speaking to in real life and I was speaking to my bosses. Now, I wrote an, an email to uh, my uh, to the CEO of Sinobr in in, in uh, uh, end of 2018, where I was describing uh, what DeFi was going to be like, and this was uh, this was shortly uh, after I think the DeFi word was invented. So I in my email I didn't know what whether to call it open finance or decentralized finance because it was so new. But the way that I saw it was that. Uh, all these different uh, financial primitives that we see in uh, Ethereum today, for example, you have uh, different ways to, uh, to do lending, different ways to do leverage, different ways to build decentralized exchanges, different ways to build stable coins. All of those are different components that can interact with each other and they can build uh, exactly like what you would see in, uh, when, internet, when the internet started happening and you could see how people were starting to build on each other's small portions of, of internet solutions. So if somebody built a, a website, you can build, uh, build another website that reads from that website. If somebody builds a, a scripting uh, language that you can use on a web page, you can reuse that on a, another web page. So you have this permissionless uh, environment for innovation on the internet, and that's what, was, what allowed it to become successful over time. And I think that we are seeing that in Ethereum today that you have all these people that are experimenting with different ways to build financial primitives. And I think that's exactly what, you, if you want to revolutionize finance, not just create a store value asset, if you actually want to revolutionize finance, and then I'm talking about the uh, exchange business and the clearing businesses and the settlement networks, if you want to impact that in a way that is transformative in the same way that the internet has been trans transformative for how we produce, read, and view content, then a network like Ethereum is exactly the type of network that you would want. I mean, and if we look at what's happening in the Ethereum environment today, I mean, you are, we are seeing that in, uh, innovation happening. We are seeing things developing so quickly that it's impossible for a human being to uh, keep track of it. And what I think what most Bitcoiners do is that they get lost by looking at the, the failures that happens in Ethereum, like they look at the, the DeFi hacks, but why don't you look at the examples that are successful? Why don't you look at the examples where you have composability between different smart contracts? 
I mean, uh, many Bitcoiners, they like to do like funny uh, speculative things on exchanges like BitMEX. They like to go 10x long leverage, or they like to trade with options on Deribit. You know, what's so nice about Ethereum is that it doesn't have to be like, I, you can view Ethereum as one uh, large exchange, but any builder can come in and start to build their own specific individual component. So, for instance, uh, you, you can build, a, uh, th there are some people that are only focusing on building flash loans in Ethereum. That would be like the equivalent of you would have a whole company working inside of BitMEX to build one specific function inside of that platform. The, and those, that company uh, in the Ethereum version of this, I mean, they don't have to shake their hands with BitMEX to get the chance to build this component. And once the component is built, everybody else can leverage that component and the market will, will sort of decide which flash loan component is the best flash loan, like which one pays the lowest fees. Uh, so you have a, a marketplace of ideas where the best ones will survive. Of course, we're going to see hundreds and thousands of them that weren't well designed fail on the way while we find the, the, the good components that, that will survive. And then we'll have good components that can interact with each other. And it's going to be, you know, if you, you can, and you can get this experience today, like you can, you can uh, use Ethereum today and you can play around, like if you can play around with the different uh, DeFi tools, like you can use leverage, you can uh, swap your assets to a stable coin. You can use that stable coin as, le as collateral for uh, another leverage position. Uh, you can play around with all these different things and when you're doing that and you're only using you know, like your MetaMask plugin in your browser, you don't have to sign up with each new different, like you just go to a new website and then you execute a new financial product. I think that once you play around with that and realize like how open and free uh, finance could be, then it's, I, I don't know what kind of person you need to be to, to make the argument that no, all financial in innovation is going to happen inside of single centralized companies and, and that's the best way to do it. I mean, if, if that's the way that you think, then I don't think that you have understood anything about you know, what drives innovation and how much permissionlessness is a factor in, in creating innovation. Cool. I think that was a great, uh, a great explanation of sort of Ethereum and I think both Federica and I certainly agree with you. What about Ethereum as, you know, as an asset? I mean, you've talked about how you see Bitcoin being on the track of becoming this like asset that's accepted in mainstream finance. And you know, so far we've seen various of these investors go in and I think in general, they've always talked about Bitcoin and adopting Bitcoin. Do you think, like, how do you think Ethereum is going to kind of get adopted in mainstream finance and what about you know the all of the other crypto assets that's an interesting question because i i do often play it safe when i talk about ethereum i talk about it as this permissionless open network technology and sometimes i even say you know that ethereum is a sidechain to bitcoin and its main utility is that you can now use trust minimized bitcoin derivatives to engage in all this funny stuff that we've kept out of bitcoin and i don't I often don't take on any like reputational risk by talking about what I think about the Ethereum asset uh, in particular, but I can I can do that uh, now. I think that I'm shedding my skin and I'm and I'm at a place now where I feel comfortable to express my own ideas. And I think that you know, personally for me, if I have to choose a cryptocurrency asset, I am sold on that uh, concept that having predictability on uh, uh, the monetary policy is what's going to be most important for one of these assets to be successful in the long term. I think we are still, as a humanity, we are still uh, having like these ownerless digital assets. I think that building a structure that makes it predictable, that's the only way that you, you're you going to look at the digital asset and think of it as a real thing and not just something wishy-washy, cyber, cyberspace, you know, something that can change. And if you want to store value in something, you want that predictability. So if I have to choose, if I have to choose something, I still choose Bitcoin uh, as the asset of my preference. But as an investor, I can't only bet on you know what I think. I have to make bets on what I think that other people will think. That's what investing is all about. It's all about understanding how other people will look at this asset. And from that lens, I do think uh, that it's looking bright for Ethereum. 
because uh, while many Bitcoiners disagree that Bitcoin has a negative uh, environmental footprint, uh, because you know we often talk about how Bitcoin is revolutionizing green energy and how it's seeking out the most uh, energy sources that have been trapped and uh, that it's actually much more lucrative for miners to be using renewable sources of energy. I think that that's a complex argument. And I think that Ethereum, if they can successfully deploy proof of stake, which many Bitcoiners don't think that they can, and I definitely think that they do can but, uh, do that, then I think it's going to be appealing to a large portion of investors when you say, we don't burn any electricity. We just lock up our liquidity and come to consensus that way. And they're going to say, wow, that's so smart. Like, So you don't burn a whole country worth of electricity on securing the network, but you are as secure because if somebody uh, doubles, uh, if somebody cre creates a conflicting block in Ethereum, the amount of capital that the uh, uh, violating party gets slashed is more in proof of stake than it is in proof of work, then uh, they're going to say, you know, wow, uh, how come Bitcoiners didn't figure this out? So I think this environmentally, and especially where we are going in terms of the environment, like if you just put the environmentally friendly label on any product, there's that's going to be appealing to a large portion of investors. And I think what the, like, it's very interesting what the Ethereum uh, is doing now with the EIP 1595, where a portion of the transaction fees will be burnt. And that's perhaps going to make Ethereum be even more like, uh, Bitcoiners always obsess about this stock to flow ratio, right? Uh, that the, uh, the units that get minted in relation to what the total supply is, needs to be as small as possible. And the asset with the lowest stock to flow uh, is going to be the asset that everyone will store their value in. Well, I think that Ethereum might get a higher stock to flow, a higher because the stock in relation to the flow, then the stock to flow needs to be high. Uh, I think that Ethereum will have a higher stock to flow than Bitcoin. And so if you say that we have a network that doesn't have any environmental impact and we have a lower, we have a higher stock to flow, so the asset is more scarce. I just think that uh, that's going to be appealing to a large portion of investors. And especially, like there are other, other metrics that you can look at as well, like which network is settling the highest number of billion dollars uh, in, in transaction volume on, on the network. And if that's going to be Ethereum because they are settling all the stable coins and they are uh, doing their exchange uh, settlements on chain instead of off chain, which bit, uh, in the way that Bitcoin is doing it, then people are going to look at like Bitcoin, Ethereum. They're doing more transactions in the network. They're transferring larger amounts. They are environmentally friendly, and and there are also other things that Ethereum can do uh, extremely well. For for example, building privacy solutions within the protocol so that you can send around an ether or a stablecoin where the sender, the receiver, and the amount has been anonymized by zero knowledge proofs. You can do that uh, in Ethereum too. Uh, so I, I think that. There are a number of different reasons why I can see that investors would look at Ethereum and they, they would pretty much look at it the same way that, you know, Bitcoiners think that mainstream investors look at gold and Bitcoin. So here's one asset. Uh, here's another asset. This one does a lot of things better and it's cheaper. So obviously I should have a position in that one because if it reaches the valuation of the previous one, which it should, because it's more secure, it's, it's faster, it's doing more transaction volumes and that's uh, less of an environmental footprint. I mean, that's why I, I think that's the investment uh, thesis for Ethereum for me. And that doesn't mean, you know, that I necessarily think that the loose monetary policy or whatever is the, or, or a flexible base layer that is prone to bugs is the best way to build a monetary system. But, you know, I have to bet on what I think that other investors will do. And I think that other investors for a long time will, will see uh, Ethereum in the same way that Ethereum see Ethereum. I'm not saying all of them will. So I, th I think that, uh, you know, I'm still major, primarily I'm optimistic about Bitcoin. But the, the factors that play in favor of Ethereum are so large that I think it, it's a good investment. And you can't have 100% of your net worth in Bitcoin, right? It's you got to put some, so at least you got to take at least 10 or 20% and put it in something else. And I think that Ethereum is excellent as one of those other things that you can, that you can have in your portfolio. Another way that um, the Bitcoin and Ethereum communities um, differ from one another is um, the Bitcoin community's almost categorical rejection of all things token, right? Where do you think that stems from? And um, why do you think 
you know, from from my very Ethereum biased eyes, it feels very stubborn because token economics, you know, they, they work, you know, at least to some. I mean, I'm not going to say that every token design is a good token design, but I'm going to say say that there's many things you can do with a token that you can't do without. So this almost categorical rejection of tokens seems weird to me. Can you explain that? I think I agree with you. Um, in, 2000, in the beginning of 2020, uh, a lot of people were making uh, forecasts for the year. And I only, made, I only made one forecast. And my forecast was that we would see governance tokens come back. Uh, these div dividend earning uh, governance tokens that we see now in, in, in a lot of these platforms like Compound, Uni, Avi, that uh, type of governance token, I mean, it's not, uh, it has a lot of issues, but I think that genuinely, why is the stock market so large? It's because people want to uh, own equities of successful, successful businesses. And that's exactly, like, of course, that's going to be uh, happening in the Ethereum landscape as well. Actually, it was a, a, a bit of a, a shock to me because I was... Uh, one of those hardline Bitcoiners that uh, had also become very negative towards every different type of funny token, like all the different tokens on, on Ethereum. What was the purpose of all those things? But I think that uh, these new types of uh, tokens that you have on Ethereum today, they are very different from the, the uh, tokens that we saw in 2017. In 2017, the type of tokens that people were launching where basically like I have a service that runs on Ethereum and in order to use the service, you have to pay me in a specific currency. And it's like, why, why can't I just pay you in Ether? Or, uh, you know, why, you have to, why do I need to pay you in this uh, shitty, illiquid, volatile token? And I think that, uh, and, and then there were a few other tokens, like uh, some, some of them were like just upfront uh, breaking securities law. Um, so I think that Bitcoiners saw all these failed token experiments and came to the conclusion that, you know, we have seen hundreds and thousands of different token experiments. All of them have been embarrassingly poorly designed and failed in a number of embarrassing ways. And I think that now it's 2020 and we have governance tokens now that are more equity resembling and actually can actually benefit some decentralized protocols because they have voting rights and they take away some of the control from the central operator. Like if you, have, if you need to have an admin key in a smart contract, you can distribute the control to a number of token holders, then they can vote on changes that need to be uh, implemented into the smart contracts. I mean, that's generally like a good thing. It's an improvement of the uh, centralized alternative, and it at least creates a modicum of decentralization in many of these financial stuff that you have on Ethereum. But I think that, you know, being a Bitcoiner is hard. If you have been a Bitcoiner for many years, you are constantly getting attacked. Like uh, people are uh, always, like the mainstream media is always coming out Aaron, like uh, using misinformation to slander Bitcoin all the time. The altcoin industry is also fighting uh, with Bitcoin by talking about how uh, Bitcoin is slow and that there is no reason for a cryptocurrency to to be doing only six transactions per second. And like all, Bitcoin is is such a hostile environment. You're getting attacked from all different fronts. And I think in order to survive in this climate for a long time, you build this sort of in immune system, like a rhetoric, like it's a, a shell that you build around yourself where you have the same answers to everything. Like, so in order to sh not get lost in the weeds with all these people that want to distract you, distract you from working on Bitcoin, you just have this immune system where you shut everyone down. As soon as they say something, you say, well, you're a scammer and that's a, that doesn't work. And I think like for those people that uh, have limited time, like not everybody has the privilege that I have, like my job is literally to look at different token constructions and scalability solutions and privacy. Like I have time to look into all that stuff. But if you are like a normal person, you want to get into cryptocurrency, you, you, you learn Bitcoin. And then as soon as you step out of Bitcoin, you get eaten by wolves. Right. And you learn that like you, that happens to you for, for a lot of people that try to do something out of Bitcoin, they do get wrecked. It happens a lot. So then they build this, it's like a survival instinct. Like you have to come up with a solution. Like how can I be a Bitcoiner and how can I survive in this climate? And that's why I think that they are the way that they are. And I think it's just a, it's a time constraint. It's, they don't have time to meet every argument all the time. But that, of course, yeah, it does lead them to miss um, genuine, genuinely useful things. Uh, 
That's why I always get into arguments with Bitcoiners. Like, for instance, when roll-up technology was new, that's a specific layer two type of scalability solution that works on Ethereum. And frankly, I think it, it has uh, a lot of usability advantages over Lightning that like now I think that you know, perhaps roll-ups are a more interesting short-term scalability solution than Lightning can be. I cannot talk about that with Bitcoiners because it comes from Ethereum, so it needs to be a scam, right? So yeah, it, it, this it's an immune system. It does cause some problems. That's how I that's how I summarize the situation. Yeah, that makes sense, and I think it it's definitely. But you know, when I speak with people who are like not so much in the crypto space, and they they come in and you know they interested in different tokens, then it, it often just shows like how hard it is to assess like the quality of a project if you're not really deep in the industry. And of course, it's very true that there's just so many bad projects that have very, very high market caps. And so I think from that perspective, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying. And I think actually it's the saying like, oh yeah, let's put 80, like, I don't know, 80% in Bitcoin, 20% in Ether or something. It's probably a great strategy for like, you know, 98% of people who don't want to actually spend the time and like go deep. Right. Yeah. So we talked a bit about, you know, this bull market and you've spoken about, you know, first of all, this infrastructure that has gotten built out, you know, after the 2017 market that's now here with, you know, custodians and a lot of these other types of service providers. And you've talked about the macro environment. You know, what else is different in this bull market? I think that the... For, for a person that really wants to understand how the uh, Bitcoin or, and cryptocurrency landscape has evolved, I think that uh, there are two articles that I, that I can re recommend that's really good reading. And uh, the first one is by Nick Carter, where he talks about uh, uh, nine different Bitcoin charts that are already at their all-time highs. Uh, the second one is by Arjun Balaji, uh, where he talks about how the... Uh, uh, market infrastructure has changed. And I think those two pieces together, they they overlap pretty well, but they give you sort of a cohesive picture of how things have transformed in the uh, in the industry. If you look at for institution uh, for, uh, for what it's like for an institutional investor to get exposure to cryptocurrencies as an asset class today. So, for instance, I can I can name some of the takeaways that I personally found was very useful. Uh, if you look at the liquidity of cryptocurrencies uh, as an instrument, and Bitcoin in particular, if you went to an OTC dealer in 2017, these spreads were between 50 and 200 basis points. And now, three years later, it's decreased from that to uh, between 5 and 20, so 20 basis points. So it's basically an order of magnitude tighter spreads. And for institutional investors, tight spreads, that's like, that's their bread and butter. That's what they want. And the reason why that has happened has to do with a number of different things. For instance, uh, one major thing that has happened in the industry that we didn't, didn't have before are lending institutions. So now you can loan, both retail, both retail investors and institutional investors can loan Bitcoin, um, which they couldn't before. In 2017, there was basically no uh, lending at all available and now it's a three billion dollar like it's a massive industry right now um, you also have to make a cryptocurrency transaction it can be quite tricky uh, sometimes in terms of the security like if you want to sign if, if you want to execute a bitcoin transaction on the mainnet if you are like you cannot if you're an institution you cannot just do it from a laptop you can, can't just sign a transaction on that laptop because then that person would have the power to send that transaction wherever wherever he wants, and most like multi-signature solutions that you can use have before been too clunky, too untested uh, to use. Nowadays, you have solutions where you can use like multi-party computation solutions that aggregate signatures in a in using very nice trader suitable workflows, so that you can sign on-chain transactions in uh, institutional caliber capacity. Uh, so it's uh, like the infrastructure has gotten much more mature in that way. And that's also reflected, like if you look at uh, the volumes that we're seeing in different Bitcoin products, you can look at the options market. In 2017, we barely had an options market for Bitcoin. 
now it's a it's a booming market. It's uh, it's getting very large. Uh, the futures market, which was uh, uh, spot tra traditionally is spot, the spot market, has been the main one, the driving one in in uh, in the Bitcoin industry. But now, three years later, it's actually the futures market that's the largest market in, in that's trading the largest amount of volumes in, in in the cryptocurrency industry, and that has to do with the fact that there are more professionalized players trading these markets now. Uh, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange that everyone was expecting in 2017 to bring the institutions into Bitcoin, that didn't really happen. Like the, in 2017, barely anything happened when they launched. But now uh, spot volumes in the retail market are still far away from their all-time highs. It's still like if you look at the, how much uh, volumes the retail people are doing on the spot markets now when we are approaching the all-time high, it's still uh, a, a bit away from where we were in 2017. But meanwhile, if you look at the institutional platforms like the CME, then we are already at all-time high uh, volumes there. So it's while the retail market has sort of been lagging a little bit, the uh, institutions have sort of come in and the, the retail market haven't really... I, I think it's kind of funny, like the way it happened in 2017, where the retail market was trying to front run the institutional investors. And the only thing that they got was this big collapse where Bitcoin crashed from $20,000 to $3,000. And then the institutions really did come in successfully, slowly, before anybody noticed it. And now we're back at $20,000. And now it's the retailers that are like, oh, where's my Bitcoin? Did I have some? Did I, or did I sell at the bottom in 2018? So like they tried to beat Wall Street. Uh, and I think that uh, for a lot of uh, retail investors, they kind of failed at doing that. Uh, so it's a, a bit sad, I suppose, to see. Yeah, but we can we can go now, uh, through a number of other different things that have changed. Uh, I think one of the one of the things one of the things that I want to uh, uh, make sure that I mention is that uh, Bitcoin used to be the uh, main trading pair to all other types of cryptocurrency assets. So if you had Litecoin, uh, it would have the majority of its volume in uh, in a Litecoin Bitcoin trading pair. But now. Uh, the largest trading pairs on all exchanges in terms of volume are stablecoin denominated. So instead of instead of Bitcoin being the central asset to all these other uh, cryptocurrencies, you now have stablecoins like uh, Tether, USDT, that is now the centerpiece to all these uh, cryptocurrency markets. So that's uh, also very interesting to see. I think that uh, was bound to happen. I mean, you cannot have all these other assets priced in yet another volatile asset. You need, I mean, the dollar for what it's worth, I mean, it's still the most stable one uh, in terms of volatility. So that was bound to happen, but it's still like a, a major shift in how this industry works and, and, and how it operates. Uh, yeah, I have a, like a, a long list of other examples. I don't know, uh, maybe it will get too boring to go through all of them. <laughs> Well, uh, one thing I would love to ask you about, and, and you you brought this up, right? Which was, uh, you know, the re the enormous retail interest we saw in 2017-18, and how how do you think that's gonna play out? So first, so or let me let me step back a little bit. How do you think this bull market overall is going to play out? Because the last time, right, we had this. Uh, insane fervor, crazy exuberance. It went up like a rocket and then down like a rocket. Uh, and then it was kind of dead for a while. And of course, it was very retail driven. So how, you know, how long do you think this bull market is going to be? What is going to end this bull market? And when is, when are retail investors going to come in and in what way? Yeah, I think those two questions are heavily inter in interlinked. I think that the bull market is going to end the moment when the retail interest sort of climaxes in, the, in exactly the same way as it did the last time. Uh, but I, I think that the, meanwhile, the institutional interest is building up for Bitcoin and Bitcoin is appreciating in value. Uh, right now, it's mostly institutions dr driving this, but that's going to drive in the retail investors as well. So I think that for the uh, for the uh, short term or mid term, we're going to see uh, retail investors and institutional investors driving up the price of Bitcoin sort of in parallel with each other in a like a joint force. And but I do think that it's impossible with an asset 
like Bitcoin to avoid the phenomenon where speculation and fervor gets the better of the, the, uh, the retail investor. So I think it, it might take longer this time to, to reach the peak because we might have this, uh, Nick Carter just described it in a nice way, I think he called it, instead of, instead of having a melt up, we have this sort of slow burn. So that can, could go on for, for a longer time where Bitcoin just keeps growing and growing. But I, I personally do think that once Bitcoin cr uh, crosses the all time high, which is going to happen pretty soon, Bitcoin is going to come back into the uh, mainstream press, the retail uh, people who dismissed Bitcoin. And I think even though that there were a lot of people who got attracted and, and actually bought cryptocurrencies in 2017, they were an even larger portion of people who looked at it and said, that's a bubble and I'm not going to buy any. But the way that this, the, the, the psychology of, of uh, the markets uh, and in Bitcoin in particular works is that, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's easy to dismiss something the first time that you see it. Like you, you never heard about it before. It's, uh, it's gone up 2000% uh, in a year. Uh, you don't understand how it works. It's probably a scam. Warren Buffett is saying that it's rat poison. Uh, Bill Gates is saying that it, he would short it if he could. Uh, like all these people that you turn to are looking skeptical about it. Uh, so it, it was a, it was a easy decision to make that Bitcoin was a scam in 2017, and I thought I think that that's generally how most retail investors, a, a much larger larger portion of those who actually bought it, I think re rejected it. But when it comes back like a second time now, and now it's coming back with all these endorsements from like people that you would never have believed would endorse Bitcoin, like uh, Stanley Druck Druckenmiller is the, uh, viewed as some like the, the greatest investor of all time. It has that type of endorsement and BlackRock that is saying that it's, it's, it's going to compete and start to outcompete gold. I think that with that type of endorsement, when it comes back at you and these retail investors that just wrote it off as, uh, as, as nothing, when they see it coming back, they're going to understand that, okay, I was wrong to dismiss this the first time. Because if I was right, then it wouldn't be coming back. Like most financial bubbles, they don't pop in your face and then they, they swell to the same exact same size again. If that happens, that's, a, that's the best way that you can convince somebody that they made an incorrect assessment of, of, of what it actually is. So I think that the, the retail investors, they are going to come back and they're going to come back in large numbers and what's inevitably going to happen when that happens is that uh, I mean retail investors they are still so skittish when it comes to holding an asset that they don't they can't see and they can't touch so uh, I do think that we're gonna have a big run-up and it, we're gonna have a very tragic collapse at some point and I mean that's just the nature of Bitcoin I Bitcoin always crashes it's gonna crash again even though we're going to land much softer on a higher level this time because there are institutions that can do a fundamental valuation of Bitcoin and, and really make the assessment that, no, Bitcoin shouldn't be worth less than 5% of gold. And if they make that assessment, then you know Bitcoin shouldn't be trading under $20,000. So they're going to be buyers under $20,000. So we have like a price floor now, which, which is going to, at the end of this bull run, we're going to have a price floor that is going to be much more uh, robust because there are uh, serious allocators behind the asset class now. Uh, but we're still going to have that same type of over-speculation and hysteria uh, could even become bigger this time. So like, I don't want to give price points like where I exactly see this happening and I don't want to give time frames either. But yeah, that's my general sentiment that uh, it's, it's, it's going to happen again. But uh, if you just hold you're going to be better off than you were last time. Do you think volatility is the biggest risk um, facing the crypto industry right now? Or do you see something else? No, I personally, I don't see volatility as a risk at all. It's just the growing pains. Like it's having acne when you're a teenager, right? It's uh, uncomfortable, uh, looks weird, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. Like everybody goes through that. Every asset class in the world that wants to go from zero dollars to a hundred trillion dollars needs to be volatile. Like, how could you? How could the asset not be volatile during that time if there is no, uh, if it isn't easy for a normal person to do the valuation? The most obvious risk is the same one that uh, are still keeping 
a lot of people on the sidelines, and I think perhaps Ray Dalio is the best example, uh, who's a person that Bitcoiners believe like he would be the ideal person to understand Bitcoin because he has the right type of understanding for gold and for financial markets, and he completely understands how the central banking regimes leads to financial bubbles and unsustainability. So why can't he, like, why isn't he on our team and why doesn't he understand Bitcoin? And that has to do with that he doesn't, he can't envision a future where Bitcoin would be allowed uh, into the financial mainstream, that the governments would come in as soon as Bitcoin becomes sufficiently large to be a real threat and they would ban it. They, and they have different ways to do that. They can, they can make it extremely cumbersome to, to use uh, through taxation. Uh, they can also uh, do it the way that's looking more likely that they're going to do it now, which, which is by uh, imposing KYC on centralized exchanges and, and making sure that they cannot withdraw Bitcoin to a wallet that hasn't previously been uh, approved and whitelisted by the exchange that they know the name and the user of that, that wallet. So they can try to, to uh, destroy the privacy of Bitcoin, and that would be uh, a way for them, I suppose, to co-opt the system, because if you remove privacy from Bitcoin, you also remove its security because you would have, at the end of it, you would have uh, a network that would be much more, where the gates would be much more closed, uh, the network would be more permissioned, and if everybody stays in these uh, exchanges and they don't see any point of withdrawing to a, to, a, to a wallet where the government can still track you, then they can start to do other things, like they can introduce fractional reserve banking on these uh, uh, exchanges so that uh, they wouldn't be fully collateralized by actual bitcoins in the exchange and then you know we're just coming back to this same exact uh, same type of uh, financial infrastructure that we have today uh, so i think personally i don't think that uh, that it's going to happen i don't think that the uh, i think personally that the bitcoin is too hard to stop uh, and even though that you can successfully stop it in one country i don't think that you can stop it in every country and if you cannot stop it in every country, the only thing that you are doing when you're trying to fight Bitcoin is you're shutting yourself out. You're sh shutting your own population out from Bitcoin, while other uh, people in other countries are getting to, to benefit from the value appreciation, while your own population doesn't benefit from that. And it's going to make your own population poorer while the other people get, become richer. So I think that when governments realize that, that they're only shutting themselves out by... by trying to fight this thing, that's when they're going to stop trying to fight it and start trying to win on being Bitcoin optimistic. So, but I, I wouldn't say that I know that this is for sure, like uh, that Bitcoin is going to, going to beat the governments for sure. I think that if I had to come up with one big risk that could disrupt this whole industry, I would say that the biggest risk is that the G20 gets together and puts out extremely adverse regulation for all types of cryptocurrency assets. That would be the worst thing. It could definitely happen. And I think that that's just one of the risks with our industry, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's, let me ask one last question. So let's say all your Bitcoin dreams come true and, you know, Bitcoin is like wildly successful and, you know, you're looking kind of, let's say 15, 20 years in the future. If you think of kind of like your average person let's say where you live in, in Sweden, what do you think the biggest change is going to be because of that, like in their, in, you know, in their life and in their own reality? I think that the absolutely largest change for an average person is their whole mindset when it comes to how they deal with their finances. Because right now, if you have money in your bank account and it's starting to reach a point where you don't want to see this portion of cash get swollen by inflation. And I mean, I, I personally do not feel comfortable leaving, let's say, 100,000 or 1 million Swedish kroner on a bank account. I, I don't feel comfortable doing that because I know that it deteriorates in value over time. And these, the, the inflation that we have, it is still like substantially large that it is a problem uh, that you would be stupid not to invest in other things. So... Most people today, they know they feel the urgency to invest their capital in the stock market or buy uh, real estate. So those are the two things that people do with their capital, uh, I would say, uh, primarily uh, buying index funds or uh, buying a house. 
But if Bitcoin, if we reach this ideal scenario where Bitcoin becomes a universal hard money, where the supply is fixed, then you're not going to see uh, depreciation of your wealth over time. You are actually going to see appreciation of wealth over time just by holding on in Bitcoin. Uh, so then you won't have to allocate your capital. You won't have to lock up all your capital in a house for your entire adulthood. And you don't have to have these scary uh, real estate loans that make you sleep with fear every night that the housing market is going to collapse and uh, uh, you're, you're going to go broke from that. And you're not going to... I think that it will create a much less nervous climate for people uh, in terms of how they manage their wealth. And I think it's going to deflate some of these uns unsustainable asset bubbles that we have uh, in the stock market. And it's gonna, going to return uh, a lot of assets to their sort of um, rational pricing. So the, a house could, for instance, be priced by the utility value of the house. Like, what do you actually want to pay to live in a house and not how much of capital do you want to deploy to your mortgage uh, because that's a, a good way to, to deploy capital. So it's going to deflate a lot of asset bubbles it's, and it's going to decrease stress, I think, for a lot of people. And I think that if you, if, you're, if you don't have to have your capital locked up in loans or in the stock market, and it could be like your capital could actually be the same currency that you have in your uh, account, then I think you, you, a, lot, a lot of people are scared about that Bitcoin is going to lead to this environment where nobody spends their cash and the whole economy is going to collapse. I think that the easiest way to get people to spend is to allow them to have uh, cash in their wallets. I mean, now we, we force people to, to deploy the capital to large assets where they are locked away and people don't touch them forever. But if they, still have, if they instead have just Bitcoin and that's where the value is aggregated, then I think that they're going to have no problem. Yes, I can pay a little bit more for this uh, coffee. Look at how much Bitcoin I have here in this wallet. And, they, and I think that it's, 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 it's going to create positive effects for, for commerce. And of course, there's going to be major consequences also on a national level between how countries can uh, settle uh, debts and these, these currency wars that we are now seeing between so many countries where they are playing around with their monetary policy as a type of... Uh, a war mechanism almost. I think that's, if we can get away from that, that's also going to be hugely beneficial. Perhaps that's going to be an even bigger, uh, have a bigger bigger impact on the world, uh, but it's it's a bit more difficult to, to, ration, uh, to reason about how exactly that would look like. Cool. Well, thanks so much. It was a pleasure to have you. Really enjoyed to hear your view about Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I think there are so many interesting points. So thanks so much. And I'm excited to kind of like follow along your thoughts in this uh, crypto future ahead of us. Thanks so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.